3.3 million Americans lost their jobs two weeks ago. Another 6.7 million Americans lost their jobs last week. And we have got at least another month of shutdown to go. This is Verdict with Ted Cruz. Welcome back to Verdict with Ted Cruz. I'm Michael Knowles. Senator, I'm sorry uh, to be joining you in these unpleasant conditions. I was hoping by now we could be doing shows in person again. Instead, we are quarantined and the economy is collapsing all around us. So we've got so much to get to. 10 million Americans have lost their jobs in two weeks. At what point does this shutdown become economically untenable? Well, we've got two disasters that are playing out simultaneously. Uh, We've got the public health crisis, and and it is real. Uh, The numbers keep growing. The fatalities keep growing. Uh, And and, and that, all of us are struggling to deal with that. At the same time, we've got an economic crisis that's playing out. And, And the economic crisis is caused by the government's policies put in place to deal with a public health crisis. That economic crisis is producing devastation. 10 million people have lost their jobs in the last two weeks. Small businesses are shutting down one after the other after the other. Restaurants, bars, uh, nail salons, uh, movie theaters. People are hurting, and we don't know how long this is going to last. That being said, we're seeing, I think, the federal government, the legislation that was passed last week will begin to provide some much-needed relief to a lot of people who are hurting. But, but we got to get through this crisis. We've got to defeat the pandemic. That's when the economic calamity is going to end, when we defeat the disease. Well, because I noticed that there's this balance that people are trying to strike. And yet you hear some people like New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, who said, if we can save just one life, then all of these policies will have been worth it. But, but of course, people die in economic collapse as well. Suicides spike, drug overdoses spike. So is there any pushback within the government, people that you're talking to, that perhaps, as we've heard, the cure might be worse than the disease here? Look, of course there is. I mean, there's, there's re- very real debate. I mean, if, if we're looking at two, three months from now, 20%, 25%, 30% unemployment, I mean, I mean, those are great depression numbers. You and I have never been alive for that. Um, I, I mean, if we end up destroying our domestic economy and destroying the international economy, th- that legacy could last a long, long time. And, and you're right that, that that kind of poverty and suffering will also take lives, that, that inevitably when you see economic devastation, you know the consequences of that are going to be with an increased poverty. You're going to have uh, increased depression, increased suicides. Uh, substance abuse, uh, all sorts of problems flow from uh, economic devastation. So there is a trade-off that has to be made. But on the public health side, uh, look, my view is we need to listen to the science and the physicians about how to combat this epidemic, how, how to contain it so that we don't overwhelm our health system. We haven't seen that happen yet, uh, but we have seen it happen in places like Italy. What, what is happening in Italy none of us want to see happen here. And, and so I think there has to be a balance between the two. We have to see when we've got the virus under control, when it's not spreading at dramatic rates, that's when we're going to have to be, be looking to uh, ease up on some of the restrictions. But if we do it early, and look, part of the problem is, think for a minute about the political dynamics. Let, let's say, Michael, you woke up tomorrow and you were the mayor of a large city. Would you want to be the mayor who said, okay, everybody go back to work, everyone go back to the restaurant, and then two weeks later, 500 people die in your city? And they all say, it was Mayor Knowles who killed them. The blood is on your hands. And look, and as you know, people will use rhetoric that hot and nasty and personal. The incentives are such, you got a lot of leaders who are struggling with what to do because you you want to save people's lives, but, but there does... Over time, you've, you, there has to be a balance. Of course. This is what keeps running through my mind when I'm thinking, is President Trump overreacting? Is Andy Cuomo overreacting? Is Gavin Newsom overreacting? Is what if I were in that position? What if any of us were in that position? And you just don't know. None of us can predict the future. A lot of the models are disagreeing with one another. Do you want to be the guy where the headlines all say, 
Senator so-and-so, or I suppose in this case, Governor President so-and-so is responsible for killing all of these people. Of course yeah. not. However, we don't yeah. want this thing to go on forever. And I know initially the president had said that he was hoping this would be over by Easter. Then that became April 30th. Then now Dr. Fauci is suggesting we might have to maintain the mitigation efforts after April 30th. I think what a lot of people want to know is not even when is this going to end, but what criteria is the government using to determine when this will end? Is it when there are no more cases? Is it when we're past the top of the curve? Is it when there are no more deaths? I mean, what are we looking at? Well, I, I started this morning on a conference call with Dr. Fauci and also with Steven Mnuchin, the, the Treasury Secretary. And, and Fauci this morning was talking about how there, there are all sorts of measures that we're looking at. We're looking at cases. We're looking at hospitalizations. We're looking at those who are in critical conditions. And we're looking at deaths. And, and we want to see each of those indicators start to slow the rate of new cases, the rate of new hospitalizations, the, the rate of new deaths, but each of those is a lagging indicator to the other. So, so, so even as we begin to see, hopefully, a decline in new cases, the rates of deaths is typically lagging several weeks behind. And so we may right. see those numbers, one set of numbers going down while another is still on the upswing. Um, but one of the challenges is, testing still, there are not that many people who have been tested. So we don't know hmm. really how widespread things are. Um, we have the numbers from the United States. The United States is starting to test more widely. It, it, it was a big problem three weeks ago getting a test. It's still challenging in some circumstances getting tested, but we're doing a lot more testing, which is one of the reasons our numbers are going up. It's clear there are places like New York City, the outbreak there is serious and, and it's concentrated. You have a lot of people close in and in a close geographic location. Um, and, and the challenge is, listen, I've asked the CDC, I've asked the, the, the medical experts over and over again, okay, how long is this going to last? Is this another two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks? What are, what are we talking about? The simple answer is they don't know. They yeah. have lots of models. But the models, if you adjust the variables even slightly in terms of the rates of contagion, how many people have it, it, it makes a massive difference in terms of how widespread this is. So listen, when the president said that he hoped everything would be open by Easter, I, I think that was a perfectly good aspiration to say, listen, we all want to get back to work. We want to get back to normal. And, and right, you saw doesn't? the media kind of lose their minds about it. Um, and Obviously, if, if the numbers are spiking and more and more people are getting sick, nobody is going to step in and say, all right, all right, let's, let's, let's all go, let's all go to a, a, you know, a basketball game. I mean, that's, that's right. not going to well, happen. But... Um, it's also the case. So, for example, all of the American press really gullibly reported that America has now passed China for infections. Give well, that's break. only because China is absolutely lying about every aspect right. uh, of this pandemic, uh, including, look, China claims in the last month that their cases went from 80,000 to 81,000. What utter garbage. So, so, so it, spread like, it spread like an epidemic and then suddenly halted altogether. I don't think anyone believes that. And, and to see the American media just, just parrot propaganda uh, I, I don't think is helpful. We do know the Chinese communist government, they tried to cover up this outbreak. They tried to suppress this outbreak. That They were complicit in, I think they didn't want to be embarrassed. So, so imagine a different world of when this outbreak first started in Wuhan, if the Chinese government had brought in health experts, if they'd quarantined the first people, we could have stopped maybe this epidemic from becoming a pandemic. We could have held it to a regional location, but instead they covered it up and tourists and travelers went from Wuhan all over the world. You had Chinese travelers going to Italy, which produced a big outbreak there. And, and so their cover up right. played a big part in, in the worldwide catastrophe we're seeing right and now. And speaking of parroting this Chinese communist propaganda, I mean, one of the 
institutions that did that most persistently and successfully was the World Health Organization. A lot yeah. of people were looking to them, and yet for for some reason it would seem that they've installed a patsy to run the WHO. They covered it up. They didn't send experts over there for months and months. Uh, I, I think the question on a lot of people's minds here is, how, how are we going to hold people responsible? Yeah. One, how are we going to ascertain the guilt here? I mean, one study said that China could have reduced the spread of this pandemic by 95% if they had just acted three weeks earlier. How are we going to hold them responsible once this is all said and done? Well, look, I think the first step is accountability. We need to find out what happened. We need to find out where the virus originated. We've talked before about how where the virus originated is just miles away from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, one of, one of only about three dozen P4 testing facilities that, that test and contain very deadly viruses. Not only that, we know that at that institute, they weren't just testing viruses, they were testing coronaviruses. And it wasn't mm. just coronaviruses, they were testing coronaviruses from bats. And, and wow. the odds, I mean, if you think of all the towns, all the cities in the world, the odds that this outbreak just happens to occur miles away from a lab that is testing coronaviruses and bats, those, those odds are minuscule. Now, here's what, the, here's what a lot of the American mainstream media is. There was a very concerted effort to respond to questions like that, but by yeah. screaming, this is a tinfoil hat conspiracy. And, it's and, a conspiracy and, theory, right? And we know, they say, that this virus wasn't manufactured. That, that was their response. And I'll tell you, that's what the CDC doctors have told me. I asked them early on, look, there were questions about, is this a bioweapon? I asked our doctors, is there any evidence of that? They said, no. They, they, they said, looking at the, the, the genome and the, the sequencing, it, it, it does not appear to be anything that was manufactured in a lab. It appears to be something that occurred in nature. So that's what the experts have told me. But right. the next and obvious question is, okay, fine, if it wasn't created in a lab, was this novel coronavirus a virus they were studying at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, that they'd gotten from right. nature, that it occurred naturally right. in a bat or some other creature that they were studying, and, and, and was there some sort of accident? Did someone get infected? Did an animal get infected? Did it somehow get out? There have been numerous stories written in the press before this outbreak about the poor uh, poor efforts at security and keeping the viruses contained at that particular institution. From the and Chinese government, they, they more or less admitted it in, in certain documents that were, were distributed at that Institute of Virology, but, rather. And so it strikes me as entirely plausible that it accidentally escaped. That, that explains why the Chinese government would be so embarrassed about it, why they would work so hard to try to suppress any evidence of it, why they would punish the whistleblowers, including the doctor who lost his life to, to, to COVID-19, yeah. uh, but who first blew the whistle where the Chinese government can, came down on him. And, and, and that, that dynamic, and I, and I got to say, with the exception of a, a handful of journalists, and by, I'll give a shout out uh, to Tucker Carlson. I think Tucker Carlson has been courageous in addressing this. I actually called Tucker yesterday as I was going for my walk with my family. I, I called him on the cell phone. I just said, hey, Tucker, thank you. Thank you for having huh. the backbone to ask right. these questions because most of the ma mainstream media, they're so desperate. The, the network executives want to be in the Chinese market. The Chinese market is billions of dollars. And because right. of the money, they won't raise these questions and, and, and the first step is, is, is ensuring that we have accountability, that we know what actually happened. You know, I have to tell you, yesterday was April Fool's Day, as you know, Senator, and I was, I was just waiting for that government bulletin to come out and say, hey, guys, <laughs> it was all a big joke. April Fool's, you can all go back to work now. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Well, I, I will say last night as I was going to bed, the girls, you know, call, called me in. Heidi said, come, come in the bed, and she was already uh, going to bed, and as I walked in, Caroline had set a cup of water on the, on the door to dump on my head. Uh, <laughs> then as I was putting him to bed, it was kind of late. It was about 1130 at night. I was trying to get him down to bed. And Catherine said, I'm not going to bed until you pull an April Fool's prank on us. So I went to our, to our bathroom and I got a can of shaving cream and came in and sprayed the girls with shaving cream, uh, <laughs> which, which obviously they run and scream and they run into Caroline's room. 
Then the door opens and Caroline has a full can of shaving cream she had <laughs> hidden in her room. Uh, so we had a giant shaving cream fight last night. I finally got the girls in bed. Uh, note to self, never get on the wrong side of Senator Cruz's daughters. They really, it sounds like they were, were planning this out long before April Fool's Day. I think also another bit of evidence that all of us staying at home, whether we're in California or New York, or even if we're a U.S. senator, we're all going a little bit crazy with this quarantine. And so now shaving cream everywhere and a cup of water on dad's head. You know, we're getting a lot of mailbag questions in because, because people are sitting around at home. They're not allowed to go out anywhere. And so I think it's important if we can get to as many as we can, because uh, there sure. are a lot of specific questions. I obviously don't know the answer to any of them, but possibly, Senator, you do. A first question from Mimi. I heard that if you're on Social Security, you have to file a new and separate tax return. How is that going to work? Well, there was guidance that came out earlier this week in, in which the Treasury Department said that if you hadn't filed a tax return in 2018, if you're on Social Security and you didn't make enough that you had to file a tax return, that you had to file a new special tax return. That hmm. was a stupid policy. It was a stupid idea. A number of us were quite critical of it. And thankfully, yesterday, Treasury rescinded it. They said, you don't need to file this special tax return. If you're receiving a Social Security check, you will receive your relief check. That was the right outcome. It's where it's where they should have started, but I'm glad they got there. Right, of course. You don't want people who are on a fixed income, who are particularly vulnerable to this virus, to be specifically the ones excluded from receiving the relief. That makes a lot of sense. That's, that's exactly uh, from right. From JJ. Uh, JJ asks, can required minimum deductions from 401ks uh, be relaxed due to stock market uh, due to the stock market being depressed, meaning every year uh, there at a certain point you will have to pull a certain amount of money from yeah. your 401k. But if you do it now, uh, obviously we're in the midst of an economic crisis. Is there any way to stop that? Uh, so good news on that. The answer is yes, and that was in the bill that passed Congress. So the required distributions from 401ks and IRAs are are halted for the year precisely oh, for that. That you don't want to force people, if they don't have to withdraw the, the money, you don't want to force them to do it. But also in the, in the legislation passed uh, last week, there is the ability, if you need to access your retirement savings just for cash flow to, to, to provide for your family, the, the, the penalties have also been lifted for, for accessing those as well. So, so, so there are uh, positive policies on both ends on, the, on that front. Great. Well, for those of us who haven't read every single page of that relief bill, that's a very useful information. From Mike, when is the Small Business Administration going to provide responses to applications and inquiries? The application format has changed. Nobody's getting any information or updates or funding. So how can small business owners who are probably under a lot of constraints right now yeah. get that relief money from the SBA? So that should be coming. It, it is supposed to be live and starting as soon as tomorrow, as soon as Friday. Um, and, and it's being administered. I'd say your resources, I'd go number one to the Small Business Administration website. That's one resource there that should be able to answer some questions. And number two, if you're a small business owner, um, go to your local lenders. The, the way that, that, that this, this program will be implemented is through local and community banks. And, and any small business and any business that has 500 employees or fewer will qualify for a guaranteed loan. Uh, that loan can be up to $10 million. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that loan, if you use those loan proceeds to pay for payroll for your employees, to pay for mortgage or rent for your business, or to pay for utilities, the, um, that amount of the loan that is, paid for, that is used for those purposes will be forgiven. It becomes a grant. Oh, wow. And, wow, and so that's, that's designed, the, the whole purpose of that is to keep as many people as possible employed and, and getting a paycheck. Um, mm. and, and, and so it, it is, and by the way, if you're a small business owner, let's say two weeks ago, you laid off or you furloughed a bunch of employees, you can bring them back and the loans will apply to their salaries as well. So, so it's designed. Oh, wow. So if you've already laid off workers, don't, it's not just the workers you have today. If you, if you have workers that you laid off a week or two ago, you can hire them back so that employees will get a paycheck. But from the small business owner's perspective, that amount will be forgiven, will be, will be, a, will be a grant. I'm not seeing that information anywhere. And I know that nobody's read this entire bill. So that is extremely 
hopeful news and good news for small business owners and for employees of small businesses that even if you're one of the 10 million people who lost your job in the last couple of weeks, if you're working for a small business, uh, you you can be rehired. There is a, a path to do that. A uh, question and, from and, and Jeff. And of all of the elements of, of the emergency relief bill last week, the small business program, I think, is by far the most important. We have millions of small businesses across this country that employ people. And, and we want to keep, ideally, as many people employed as possible or get them back to their jobs as quickly as possible. Of course, absolutely. Uh, next question. Is there a limit to how much money the federal government can borrow without severe consequences. You know, now President Trump is talking about a possible infrastructure bill that could, I mean, we're, we're not talking in even one trillion anymore. We're talking about many trillions yeah. of dollars. Is there a limit where we say we can't do anymore? Look, M Michael, we, we, we don't really know. It, it depends how bad hmm. this crisis gets. Last week, Congress spent $2 trillion in an afternoon. I mean, that's nearly 10% of our total national debt. That is breathtaking. And, and it's worth noting in, in, in the Senate, it passed unanimously. It was 96 to nothing. That means Bernie Sanders voted yes, and I voted yes. And every senator in between voted yes. I mean, I mean that, and the reason is this, this is a crisis unlike any we've ever seen. Um, and it's a crisis that, that the people who are hurting they didn't do anything to cause this problem. All the restaurant owners, the, the, the bar owners, the movie theater owners, they, they didn't, it, this is not like TARP. This is not like where the financial firms uh, were taking advantage of the system and, and, and created a crisis. Here, it's not their fault that, that this, this, this worldwide pandemic began. And from a governmental perspective, the costs are coming anyway. So for example, let's take the loans to small businesses. That $377 billion was appropriated. Well, we could have not done that, in which case those small businesses all would have gone out of business and those employees would all filed for unemployment and, and, and you would have seen in more and more employees on, a, on, a, on unemployment, on welfare. That's, those are massive government expenditures anyway. And so we made the determination, you know what, it's, we're in a better situation to try to essentially give a bridge loan to the small business owners to try to keep that business in existence, try to keep them hopefully in, in a few weeks or, or, or maybe longer, we will get past this, this, this shutdown and, and go yeah. back to work. And we'd like to have as many of those small businesses still viable and as many people still have the jobs that they had a month ago. Right. Of course. I mean, you've only got bad options here, right? You're, this is going to have a major cost just by virtue of it being a pandemic. So the question is, do you have that cost and lose all your businesses? You try to keep some of your businesses. Very difficult decision. You talked about like a forced stimulus plan. Um, listen, as you know, we talked about this last podcast. I don't refer to this last bill as a stimulus. I, yeah. I, I, I view it as an emergency relief bill. Nancy Pelosi is talking about wanting to spend trillions of dollars on her pet projects. We'll see what, uh, look, I think we should hold off for, for probably at least a month and see what the impact was of this emergency relief plan. And, and if we get to the end of April and, and if, God, if God forbid the virus numbers have gotten much, much worse, there are many more cases, there are many more deaths. And, and if we've seen millions more unemployed, which I think if the first has happened, the second will have happened too then I think we will see Congress come back and do something else. And, and my hope is that it, that it will not be wasteful spending, but it, but it will be targeted on relief, on A, solving the pandemic, solving the health, health crisis, and B, providing people relief who need it, who are being hurt through no fault of their own. Last question is a little uh, controversial, but people sometimes forget there's a presidential election going on. I know that it's not exactly in the news these days, but we will elect a president in November. Question is from Twitter, uncomfortably quarantined. What happens if Joe Biden is found to legitimately have competency issues by a physician, yet he was selected as the nominee? What happens then as far as who is on the ballot? You know, who knows? Um, Listen, Biden, I'll tell you one of the odd things about Biden, it, it seems like the guy is in witness protection. I mean, what, what has happened to him? <laughs> Where I, is he? Where's I, Joe? I, 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 I mean, it, it's, 
Can you recall in your lifetime ever seeing anyone effectively wrap up a nomination and then disappear? I mean, I guess he did did what was it a Facebook uh, live town hall that that he like wandered off the camera and and <laughs> didn't go very well. Did look, not go I, well. I like Joe personally. He's an affable guy, but but you know, I got to say he has slowed down more than a step or two. And <laughs> I've heard more than a little speculation that get to the convention, Democrats are going to want to pull the pr- plug and, and abandon ship. I, I don't know if that happens. Uh, under their rules, the superdelegates, you know, it's interesting that Democratic Party believes, believes in the state and believes in government. So they're much more authoritarian. So they have yeah. these things called superdelegates, which are elected officials that are basically free to do whatever they want at a convention. Republicans Regardless don't have superdelegates. Yeah, no, no, it's interesting. Republicans, Republicans don't have superdelegates. Republicans actually follow the votes of the people. The Democrats ha- have a much more top-down, power-driven system. Uh, you know, I've heard interesting speculation about Andrew Cuomo suddenly becoming yeah. the dark horse candidate. Um, I don't know. Um, it, it, I will say this, the longer this crisis continues, the more the question for every voter is going to be, what leader do I trust to lead this country in a time of, of crisis and calamity, I, I, whether it's a public health crisis or an economic crisis? And I, and I think that issue is likely to become the only issue for the Democrats at their convention and and the only issue, uh, or at least the dominant issue in November in the general election. Of course. I mean, that's the theme that everybody's talking about is unemployment, and it could affect a restaurant worker, and it could affect the Democratic nominee for president. Uh, There's a wide spectrum here and a lot of uncertainty. We will try to clear up more of it next time as things are changing day by day, but that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, Senator. I'm Michael Knowles. This is Verdict with Ted Cruz. 